have to put up last week's lecture, right? Did I do that? I don't think I did yet. So I'll um, I'll get that up here and get that cut up probably tomorrow. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm gonna put us into tablet mode and pray that it goes wrong. Okay. Not sure why the whole world has to go to hell in a handbasket every time I um, go over to. Can you not hear me, not see me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, not yeah. seeing you. Okay. Okay, so it looks like we're gonna crash. So I'm gonna have to log out and log back in. This stupid computer can't seem to handle just flipping itself into um,
Can you hear me? Yes. This is ponderous. Okay, um, let's see. Let me go ahead and again, I just, I need to use the machine in tablet mode. That's why I bought a tablet. Okay, I think we are okay now, right? Okay, so let me go ahead and share screen again. I'm sure that's infinitely entertaining when you watch back the uh, recording and get to watch me go through all that, but uh, we are recording. And for some reason, it chose to close my annotator. So let me boot that back up. But see, that doesn't cause the whole world to go to hell in a handbasket. Okay, looks like we got that successfully opened. Let me get myself back to module six. Do, do, do. Kathy, did you want to share anything with the class? Oh, just that I passed. Far, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you. I'm, I'm very relieved because I was worried about that one. <laughs> Why? Congrats. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yes. Study your butt off. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't matter. You did it. Two down, one to go, right? I mean, two to uh, go. To, yeah, I'm, I'm officially at the halfway point. Right. Good. Not counting the ethics exam, which I'm hoping won't be a big deal. <laughs> yeah, um, it's a 50 question exam. Um, you could potentially register for it and take it now because the score is good for one year. Um, so you might start looking at that. If you have any questions on that, I, I can help you to figure out you take that through Cal CPA. Okay. Um, but that um, that's a self-study 50 question exam, open book. You get the book from them, you take the exam, you send it in and you can only miss five. Um, so you gotta get a 95% on it. And um, whatever that comes out to 90% or whatever. Um, and um, if you, take it i want to say i said it's good for a year it's good for two years from the time that you take it so um so it's not a bad idea to um double check me on that i'll i'll, I'll get back to you guys on that i forgot now i had that all memorized now for some reason i'm not remembering if it was one year or two years but it's good for either one or two years so if you wanted to take it now while you're kind of in study mode, um, although passing the exam itself, the CPA exam would be the, the top priority, but uh, it's not too, too bad. It's just a lot of, you know, what is the state of California? You know, what are the ethics rules there? And they're very similar to the, some of the things we talk about in uh, regulation regarding the, the rules. So keep some of that in mind too, uh, when you get to ready to take that. Okay, good, anybody else? Okay, good. But uh, the idea is you got to register for the exam. You got to sit for the exam in order to pass it, right? So, okay. All right, good. So before we jump into um, the information here, um, I probably should have done this before I went into full screen. Uh, I want to review 
some of those extra slides that we talked about last time because they are the, it's the material that we're going to be looking at here in a little while really does sort of leverage off of uh, some of the things that um, were covered on these slides. So remember, we talked about the process and the audit, and even though they were talking about it in the context of how you would put sections in your audit program, um, I was saying you well, it's actually steps in an audit that an auditor goes through, uh, hovering around um, risk assessment procedures. And remember, I said last time, you always, you always have to conduct risk assessment procedures, always, okay? And those risk assessment procedures involve obtaining an understanding of internal control sufficient to evaluate the design keyword of the control and that the controls have been implemented. Two key words that I bolded there, designed and implemented. Based on that understanding, we make an assessment of the risk of material misstatement. We assess the risk of material misstatement, and I'm gonna go through the um, components of the risk model, but remember the risk of material misstatement is the interaction of inherent risk and control risk. We always do that. We assess the risk of material misstatement. If we assess the risk of material misstatement, we'll follow the red arrow. We will not test the operating effectiveness of the controls. We'll come straight down here and we will go into our test of details phase, our further audit procedures, and we will go directly to substantive testing. Now, if we had assessed the risk of material misstatement at less than the maximum, okay, right here, this black arrow, then you go over and you first test the operating effectiveness of the controls. And the reason I say sometimes you do that, because if you had assessed risk of material misstatement at the maximum, you would have bypassed this, right, and gone straight to your substantive testing. But here, notice, because we had assessed the risk of material misstatement at less than the maximum, we first test the operating effectiveness, and then we do our substantive testing, but you always, always, always have to do some amount of substantive testing. Okay. All right, good. Then we also had this little example where we were talking about, um, I think I gave you a jewelry shop as an example that we were doing an audit of, and we have to assess audit risk. Audit risk is the risk that will give the wrong opinion. We will give an unmodified, unqualified opinion when in fact there was some material, material misstatement that we did not detect and we should have qualified, modified our opinion somehow and we failed to do so. It's audit failure, okay? Now, we want audit failure, of course, to be low. So notice we're putting 0 0.05 there and we could also say it in um, you know, words, low, use a qualitative measure or use a numeric measure, 0 0.05 low, okay? Now, in this particular, um, we said that uh, our um, audit risk was the interaction of risk and material misstatement and our detection risk. But we also said that what? The inherent risk and the control risk interact together to generate the risk of material misstatement. So when we look at this audit risk formula, we could also look at it as IR times CR times DR, where IR is the inherent risk, and CR is the control risk, and then DR is the risk that our audit procedure will not detect the misstatement. And you can never have zero. You always have some risk for various reasons, collusion, the fact that we don't look at 100% of the transactions, there will always be some risk, okay? So if it's low at 0 0.05, and in this example with the jewelry shop, I said they had horrible controls. They just left all the jewels out. They didn't lock them up at night and whatnot. And so we just sat there and said, well, those are at maximum. We put them at one. So one for the inherent risk, one for the control risk times and to keep our audit risk low at 5%, we would have to set our detection risk at low. How do we keep a low detection risk? Well, we have to increase our substantive testing. Well, what does that mean? We said what? Nature, extent, timing, right? Nature, we use a more effective procedure. For example, we use external evidence because external evidence is more reliable. 
um, sample sizes. We use larger sample size. The larger sample size, the more opportunity that it will be representative of the population. Timing, we're going to do year end testing instead of interim testing. And by doing that, we lower our detection risk. We do the product procedures that allow us to detect the material misstatement. So I said in this little example, maybe we audit every single day's worth of transactions. And we're not going to do, even though we obtained an understanding of the internal control, we listened to the design. We said, I don't like the design of those controls. Really doesn't matter if they're implemented at this point. And so I'm going to uh, assess the risk of material misstatement at the maximum, right? Even though we still obtain understanding, we didn't test the operating effectiveness of those controls. Now, then we went down the road here to the next slide. And we went ahead and looked at a different jewelry shop, okay, second jewelry shop. And when we looked at this one now, we sat here and we said, okay, great. They tell us, let's see, I think I'm going to have to get out of uh, slideshow mode to see my little drawings on here, okay. And when we um, went to the second jewelry shop, we took a look at it. And they told us that they have a, 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 a policy of dual custody. So at all times, um, somebody's together. So the employees get there together in the morning and they put combination in the safe there. Each one does. I don't know your combination. You don't know mine. We have to put it in there, right? And the auditor gets there early to observe them doing this right they put in the combinations they put the all the uh, rings and things out all the jewelry out and then um they take a complete inventory at that point in time and they sign off on a call on a on a log that says that they did that and then a supervisor comes in a little bit later signs off on that log at the end of the day they go ahead they do another inventory count at the end of the day put everything back in the safe and there's cameras up there that are observing all of this process. We say, okay, sounds pretty good. So it's still diamond rings, things that are easy to steal. The economy's not doing too well, let's say, so we're worried about the environment. And so we say, hey, inherent risk is still at the maximum, but now I'm going to sit here and I'm gonna put my control risk at moderate. Well, if that's the case, then to keep my audit risk low at 0.05, I can accept a little higher detection risk. Never say a high detection risk. It's a higher than what we had in the previous. It's still low, but um, it's a little higher than it was before. It's 0.10. And so what happens? We go ahead and we um, will now uh, test the operating effectiveness of the control. So what's going to happen? We're going to do a walkthrough. We will do a walkthrough as part of our obtaining the understanding. So the walkthrough is the day that we get there early and we see that they show up early and both put in the combination, that they're signing off on that call log and everything. Um, if we go and they don't do the controls the way they're described to us, we say, uh-oh, control, even though we like the design, it is not implemented. And we would go back and say, okay, our control risk is at the maximum and we wouldn't test the operating effectiveness. But assuming in the walkthrough, they did everything the way we wanted them to. And now we're sitting here and we're saying, okay, now we're going to test the operating effectiveness. So we've looked at one day's worth of transactions. If our sample size now at this point is 50 days worth of transactions, let's say, then we would only have to look at 49 more transactions. So it is possible for procedures that were designed to help us obtain an understanding could actually provide us evidence for operating effectiveness, at least for the one day that we watched it through. So if our sample size was 50 days, we'd pull 49 more days, look to see that they call, signed off on that call log and whatnot. And then assuming that all worked out, for our substantive, the call log, the inventory sheet log. Um, and then for our substantive procedures, we could now use internal evidence instead of external evidence. We could um, use smaller sample sizes. I said, you know, larger sample sizes in the earlier case. And I think I said we would just audit every single day's transactions, right? Now we're just auditing, say, 50 days worth of transactions. So smaller sample sizes, extent, timing, 
we can do our procedures at interim. So we do our procedure at interim. Now we're going to sit there and maybe do our testing, assuming a 1231 year end, we'll do our testing at 930. And then we will simply have to do some limited audit procedures back towards the end of the year. They call that a roll forward, but the bulk of our testing could be at year end. That is more efficient for an auditor because by the time you get to year end, you have a lot of other things going on, wrapping up other engagements, dealing with engagements that maybe don't uh, have as good a control that you're having to do your testing there. So it allows you to do, uh, be more efficient and do something at the uh, interim phase, okay? Okay, question. Okay, good. The other one that we had here is this um, sales chart. And remember, when we're looking at our inherent risk, we have to think of the financial statement assertions, which is what existence, completeness, rights and obligations, valuation, allocation, presentation, and disclosure are our six main assertions. And so when we think about accounts, we think about assertions. So in this example, I was um, contemplating the existence assertion. And we sit here and we think of a potential misstatement. This is one of the few times that accountants get to use their imagination. Okay, what could possibly go wrong here? Okay, and the problem with the existence assertion is that they record a sale, but they never ship the goods. Or there was maybe a return and they didn't book the return. Okay, so we look for the control technique. And in this particular case, now the person that sold the item calls the customer and says, how do you like it? When we evaluated that control, okay, we thought about the inherent risk associated with that. They say they're in a competitive environment and whatnot. We looked at the control, and when we made the assessment of control risk, we say our risk of material misstatement is high here because they're in a competitive environment, and they have the problem that the same person that sold it follows up on the call. Well, that person may be trying to pad their commissions or something and say that they called and that there was actually a sale out there. Meanwhile, there really was none. That being the case, we bypass the testing of the operating effectiveness in our further audit procedures. We move directly to our substantive tests and we're going to confirm all the large accounts receivable and we're gonna take a sample of some others and we're going to conduct year end cutoff of sales made near the year end. We audit the heck out of that thing to lower our detection risk. And those procedures are geared towards the assertion, okay? You gear your procedures toward detecting the misstatement and that assertion. In the second case, still the same account, still the same assertion, still the same potential misstatement, but now they've got call logs, they've got people signing off on the call logs, they've got the internal auditors following up on those calls, we go ahead and we do a walkthrough and we do a walkthrough. We see that they're doing that. We participate in a few of the calls. We talk to the board of directors about um, what their concerns are and whatnot. And we say, okay, the control has been implemented. So now we do control testing and we take some of those sales call logs and we look at them to see that they were signed off on, et cetera. And maybe look at a few internal auditor reports. They went up to the board of directors so on. Because of that, now we can take a little higher detection risk by lowering our substantive testing. And I really kind of focused on uh, extent here. And then I just took a sample of, um, of uh, invoices to see that uh, they were correctly recording the accounts receivable. Question. Okay, good. So I want you to keep that thought process in mind as we're going. Now, what the hell is this? I have no idea what this is now. I'm not interested in cron. I'm not interested in checking the weather. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and let's take a look now and see if we can get back to uh, our text. Okay. Now, in all of that, what we didn't talk about was the concept of materiality, okay? So layered on top of that entire process of assessing the risk and whatnot, we also have to consider materiality. Now, what the idea of materiality says is that some facts are more important 
to investors and creditors than others. And it's going to be our job to figure out which items are more material because we're going to want to pay more attention to those items that have more of a chance of being involved in investment and credit decisions. Okay, so when establishing the audit strategy, the auditor should determine materiality for the financial statements as a whole. Okay, so there's going to be really three levels, financial statements as a whole. There will be performance materiality. Okay, I'm just trying to number those two. And then there may be a special materiality for certain disclosures. And I'll talk about that. So I'll talk, really talk about all three of these here in a minute. Okay, so kind of three levels that you're thinking about. Okay, now when we consider the materiality, we should consider um, the three levels and uh, we don't need to worry about the uh, Supreme Court, okay, but just come over, we should be thinking about the needs of users, okay, what is something that could, um, you know, affect the needs of the investors and creditors, and we do put the onus on the investors and creditors to know something, so, you know, we're not saying, well, gee, you know, they're babies and they're not informed, we expect them to be somewhat informed, right, those investors and creditors. Okay, now we start to take a look at factors to be considered, and they tell us that it is a professional judgment. Okay, but we are going to focus on both qualitative and quantitative factors. Both qualitative and quantitative factors are to be considered. And when we assess the materiality, we should use the smallest level of materiality that could be material to any one of the financial statements. So we're going to consider both qualitative and quantitative. Qualitative being a investor would say, if I had known the financial statements were misstated by $25 million, I would have never bought that stock. Qualitative being, if I had known the financial statements were misstated by $25,000 because of management fraud, I would have never bought that stock. Notice the dollar amount came down but because we had a qualitative factor coming in there, um, that would make the, say, if it was with accounts receivable, that would make the accounts receivable potentially more material, okay? Okay, good. Now, notice, and I want you to flashcard that we use the smallest level material materiality that could be material to any um, one financial statements, and the materiality level for the financial statements as a whole needs to be expressed as a specific amount. We need a dollar amount, okay? So how will we come up with that dollar amount? And let's just come over and take a look at how we will come up with the dollar amount. And we basically will apply a percentage to a financial statement benchmark, okay? For example, we might say that our materiality level is 5% of revenue. So we will lit literally sit there, multiply 5% times the revenue, and that will be our materiality level for the financial statements taken as a whole. We have to do that because they're telling us what? It has to be a specific amount, okay? Now you come down and we have performance materiality. And performance materiality is the amount set by the auditor at less than materiality for the financial statements taken as a whole to reduce to an appropriate low level, the probability that uh, aggregate uncorrected and undetected misstatements will exceed materiality. So we're kind of giving ourselves a little cushion there because you set your materiality level for the financial statements taken as a whole, but there could be small misstatements that will add up and exceed our overall financial statement materiality. So to guard against that, we come up with a performance materiality. So when you do an audit procedure, you confirm an accounts receivable. If you find a misstatement and it's above that performance materiality level, then you're going to ask for an adjustment on that. Okay. So if we are looking, we might say, for example, and guys, there's nothing in standard that tells you exactly how to set these, but you might take one third of the overall Okay, and by doing that, now you're setting a performance materiality that is, um, you know, less than the overall, obviously, since we said it'd be one third of the overall. Okay, flashcard that. And then also, you've heard the term probably tolerable misstatement. 
Tobel misstatement is the application of performance materiality to a particular sampling uh, procedure. Okay. Okay, good. If you have multiple locations, for multiple locations, the total volume statement for each individual location should be less than materiality level for the financial statements taken as a whole. Again, not letting those things build up and aggregate into a material misstatement. All right. Okay, so those are some of the key points here now, right? We have what? We have two levels that we've been talking about overall financial statement materiality and what? and performance materiality, okay? Overall financial statement materiality, you have to come up with it by applying a percentage to a line item in the financial statements, okay? It has to be quantified that way. And then your performance materiality will be less than your overall financial statement materiality. The materiality level that you choose should be the smallest level, the smallest level of materiality that could be material to any one of the financial statements, okay? So let's come over and let's just look at uh, this example, okay? And I think you'll see that this stuff is pretty much the way you would have to do this. I think this is a good example of how you might see this on the exam where they're gonna give you some parameters and basically see if you can follow the directions, okay? It's, it's, so it's pretty easy, you just have to follow the directions. So Evan, senior accountant and NOAA CPA is determining the overall financial statement materiality and total misstatement for his client in year two. Evan expects that there will be a low likelihood of uncorrected misstatements. I'm going to go ahead and just highlight that because that is going to determine, uh, be a factor in determining our materiality levels here, right? Overall financial statement materiality should be based on a benchmark of either total assets or gross revenue, whichever is larger and should be calculated by taking the appropriate benchmark and multiplying it by either 1% for assets as the benchmark or 0.5% if the benchmark is gross revenue, okay? And then tolerable misstatement is calculated by multiplying the overall materiality by either 70% for low likelihood, that's why it was important that we remember that it was low likelihood in this case, or 50% for high likelihood. Okay, so we come over and we look and we start to take a look at this and which one's bigger, revenue or assets? Not a trick question. Revenue. revenue. Good, revenue is bigger, so we're going to use revenue. And they tell us if it's revenue, then we should use what? 0.5%, so we pick up that revenue number times the 0.5%, which is 0.005, that gives me overall materiality of 12,500. And since we were what? Low likelihood of, um, of material misstatement, we use the 0.7, the 70%, and that gives us our tolerable misstatement. Okay, so when you looked at that, it was really, did you, you know, how was your reading comprehension? Were you able to follow the directions there? Okay. Are those typically set by CPA firms, or do you, you would, would you ever have to decide that? What is, oh, who, what do you mean? The, the, like what the levels are. Uh, it you says like. The, on the CPA? What, yeah. No, what, what the benchmarks are. No, but I'm saying, you know, is it, you know, who set, whether it's five or 7% or 1% or yeah. whatever. I mean, it's CPA firm, but I got a little confused on your question. You said, or would you have to decide that? Who's you? Who's uh, the auditor. The auditor the on auditor the engagement. Is a CPA firm. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, the auditor, the specific person on the engagement wouldn't have to decide that. That would be something the firm would give you, right? That would be part of. Okay, well. Yeah, if you're asking me what it's like in, you know, in practice, probably the firm that you're not the partner yeah. of <laughs> will tell you, the partner will tell you that's what they want it to be. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's a firm thing. It's not in standard. It's absolutely not in standard, but it, it's a firm thing. But I just want to kind of steer you a little bit away from that notion that, well, they're going to tell me these things. Uh, somebody else has to tell me. So why is Evan, senior accountant at NOAA, doing this? Well, um, you know, there Evan would be following what the partner is telling him. But often the CPA exam treats you 
as the partner, right? You're the one that's deciding that, but they'd have to give you the numbers if they wanted you to come up with a quantitative, you know, but notice, you know, we had to know which things to pick by picking, you know, by getting the information, low likelihood, that kind of thing. Okay. Okay, good. Now you could also set a materiality level for a particular type of transaction account balance, or more importantly, uh, disclosure, okay, is really the way I think of this. And so you could have an amount that is lesser than the financial statements taken as a whole. For example, you may have a lower level of materiality for a footnote dealing with the loan covenant because that's a very important disclosure because if they you know have a debt to equity ratio that falls out of certain tolerance levels the senior debt is going to be called or something well that's a pretty important disclosure so you might want to lower your materiality level for something like that again we're thinking about the needs of users right Okay, and what's going to affect their decision to buy stock or offer, offer credit. Okay, okay, good. And then, you know, you just don't put materiality out there. Guys, we're still talking about planning phase here. You don't set up the materiality in the planning phase. So there, I'm done. You know, I'll never change it again as the audit proceeds. Maybe you sit there and you realize, wait a minute, I actually have a high level of risk and material misstatement. Well, then you'd have to go back and readjust those materiality levels as you go along. Okay. Okay, good. So let me go ahead and flashcard that point. And then let's go ahead and see how our how my computer is going to work for this first uh, class question. Okay, good. Seems to be working. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and um, take a look at this one. And um, okay, not the greatest um, turnout here. Um, most of us got it, you know, well, not most of us got it right. The ones who got it right uh, is the largest percentage here, but still um, not so great. So let's go ahead and take a good look at this question. And so um, I'm just going to 
take that down. So let's just look at this one. Which of the following statements is, and guys, again, this is why it is important to read all the choices because if you missed the not, okay, if you missed the not, then you would probably pick A. And if you didn't look at the rest of them, you just made a big mistake, right? You just threw some points out the window. So which of the following is not correct about materiality? And let's just look at A, the concept of materiality recognizes that some matters are important for fair presentation and financial statements with GAAP, while other matters are not as important. Absolutely, that's what we're doing. We're trying to focus on the more important items, right? Okay. B, an auditor considers materiality for the financial statements as a whole in terms of the largest aggregate level misstatement. It's what? The smallest, okay? It, because of the interrelation between the different financial statements, something that is material to the balance sheet maybe isn't material to the income statement, but it will affect the balance sheet, right? So we'd have to use the lowest level of materiality that could be material to any one of the financial statements, choice B. Okay, that's the correct answer. C, material judgments are made in light of surrounding circumstances and necessarily involve both quantitative and qualitative. I don't know why anyone would pick C because we kind of made that point very clear, I thought, in the book. An auditor's consideration of material is influenced by the auditor's perception of the needs of a reasonable person who will be relying on the financial statements. Yeah, we expect that individual to have certain training and whatnot, and obviously we expect them to be uh, reasonable, okay? Question on that one? Okay, good. Now, what I wanna do is get into module seven, okay? But I just wanna one more time remind you that we have what? We have risk assessment procedures that we always do. We also call that obtaining an understanding phase, keywords, design, implementation, and assessment of risk. What risk do we assess? The risk of material misstatement. Based on that assessment, that determines what? Determines our further audit procedures. If we assess the risk of material misstatement at the maximum, we bypass the testing of. Key phrase, the operating effectiveness of the controls go straight to substantive testing. We're going to be using external evidence instead of internal evidence. We'll take larger sample size and extent. Timing, we'll do our testing at year end instead of interim. If we assess the risk of material misstatement at less than the maximum, when we go to our further audit procedures, also known as the test of details phase, we will first test the operating effectiveness of those controls, then go to our substantive testing, and now we can use internal evidence instead of external. We can use smaller sample sizes, our extent item, and we can do interim testing instead of year end, okay? All right, keep that model, keep those slides in the back of your mind as we go through, and let's jump back in now uh, to the textbook, okay? All right, so we come down and we're talking about risk assessment procedures. Do we always have to do these? always, right? Always have to do risk assessment procedures. And let's go ahead and flashcard, even though I kind of gave you a flashcard that calls out the key things, let's flashcard the steps that go into the risk assessment procedures now that we're seeing it laid out that way in the book, which is obtain an understanding of the entity and its environment, obtain an understanding of the internal control, inquire of the audit committee, okay, about the risk of material misstatement. Just kind of think about that jewelry store example as we're going through this. Keep that in the back of your mind because really we were describing that we were doing those things. Perform analytical procedures, which we'll talk about here in a little while. Conduct a discussion amongst the engagement team. You pull the team together and you talk to them about risks related to misstatement. And then there's sort of, you know, I don't know, there's going to be a flashcard, other procedures, save yourself some writing there. You don't have to flashcard that. That doesn't really tell you anything. Okay, all right, good. Now you come over and we say, obtain an understanding of the entity and its environment, right? Okay, and so we have that high level flashcard. Guys, I'm not gonna ask you to flashcard anything here because it is very, um, obvious, you know, that if you're trying to understand the entity, you'd want to understand its industry, regulatory factors, okay, um, other 
external factors, for example, um, the general economic condition, interest rates, inflation, et cetera, right? Okay, again, I'm not asking to flashcard this, guys. I think you can tell that that's obtaining an understanding of the uh, entity, right? Okay, now, once we have done all that work, okay, of understanding the entity, and again, I don't think that there's a whole lot of, uh, there's a little overkill on all this, just, you know, very basic kind of idea that you understand the entity, but then come down and let's look at the required documentation, okay, over on the next page. Now, I generally ask my students to flashcard, okay, the, um, documentation. And the reason I ask you to flashcard documentation is for two reasons. One, it reminds you what has to be documented if they ask you that, and that's kind of obvious. But there's generally the um, documentation is a nice summary of what they just told us we have to do in this particular area. So that's why I like you to flashcard that. So let's just take a look, flashcard that, what were the relevant industry regulatory factors, the nature of the entity's operations, ownership, governance structure, type of investments the entity makes, the way the entity is structured, the entity selection and application of accounting, okay, the entity's objectives and strategies related to business risk, and review of the entity's performance. Okay, so you see that we kind of took all those things that we talked about on those previous pages and they had tables and everything else and boiled it down to just a flashcard which is also what we're supposed to document uh, in this uh, for this kind of work. Okay. Okay, good. Now we come over and uh, we talk about analytical procedures. Okay. And obviously, you know, you're going to make inquiries. Okay. And those inquiries include the board of directors, et cetera. Right. Okay. Um, so you come over. And let's look at analytical procedures, okay? And analytical procedures must be applied in the planning phase, okay? Analytical procedures always have to be applied in the planning phase. And analytical procedures during the planning phase are at a high level, such as comparing financial statements to budgeted or anticipated results, comparing last year to this year, these kinds of things, okay? So they're a very high level. So you can go ahead and flashcard that, okay? And generally, um, financial data are used, although relevant non-financial data can also uh, be used, okay? And uh, let me give you an example and flashcard that, but let me give you an example of what we're talking about here. So let's say I'm auditing a laundromat and I'm sitting there and I'm saying, well, gee, you know, I have to do some analytical procedures and um, I'm not really sure what or how I can get the evidence to support washing machine revenue. So what do I do? I ask the company to show me their water bill, the laundromat to show me the water bill. And I look at that water bill and the water bill and I'm not looking at the dollar amount on the water bill, I'm looking at the gallons. And I do some sort of analytical procedure to say, well, look, if they you know, make $5, I don't know what they charge you these days to do a load of laundry at the laundromat, but if they charge you $5, well, I don't know what they would charge, they charge you $5 per load, $3 per load, and there's this many washing machine and the company would have done, you know, 10,000 loads or something during the course of a year, I don't know, then the washing machine revenue should be what, around 30,000? So why are they showing, you know, 50,000? That's the kind of analytical procedure they want you to do in planning because now you know in the planning phase, you've got some work to do to figure out what's going on with that washing machine revenue. And we'll talk more about that when we get deeper into analytical procedures uh, in our next chapter, okay? I'll extend that example, okay? Again, the objective of analytical procedures um, in the planning phase is to look for things that are unusual. Where do they say that? Analytical procedures. During planning, I think it says it in the pass key. 
It's just to identify unusual or unexpected relations. Okay. I don't know why they put that in the pass key. Okay. During the plan, the auto perform, uh, during plan perform analytical procedures related to. Okay. It's also the second bullet point right above. What second? Oh, right here. Thank you. This is where I want it. Okay. What I don't like about that pass key is they're um, calling that out as it relates to revenue there. And even though that's a true statement, this is not the time to be talking about it, okay? Because they tell us you have to do analytical procedures over revenue, but that's really in the fraud standard more than in the standard uh, on, plan, on planning. And we'll get to that. Even though the fraud standard is in planning, they have made that clear in the um, fraud standard that revenue has to have analytical procedures over it. And we'll get to that next time, okay? Okay, good, thank you. I couldn't find it for some reason. Okay, good. Now we come over and we have to have a risk assessment discussion with members of the audit team, okay? And we're basically going to make sure that they understand that, uh, what the level of susceptibility is to uh, misstatement. And uh, it can be held concurrently with the fraud discussion, which again, we'll get into the fraud uh, discussion, the fraud standard uh, next time, but you can go ahead and include that point on the flashcard too. And we'll mention again about the fraud standard uh, next time, okay? It should emphasize the need for what? Professional skepticism potential misstatements, okay, right? Since we have to come up with a potential misstatement in order to correctly find the controls that will or detect that misstatement and then apply audit procedures that will help us to detect that misstatement, that would be something that uh, would be part of that discussion. So why don't you just go ahead and just flashcard here these things that I highlighted here uh, as part of that assessment discussion, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and um, they tell us that it is an ongoing assessment. Uh, another thing to think about, we're not talking about it in this chapter, but data analytic software is great for doing these risk assessment procedures. And we'll talk more about that um, <clears throat> a little bit later, particularly in the analytical procedures, right? So let's go ahead with all that and let's take a look at, Another couple questions.
Okay, guys, I'm going to go ahead and um, end the poll for this one. And uh, good, uh, good. I'm, I'm happy to see um, that, you know, we did well on this question. 91% of us got it. Um, now, I find it interesting, though, that nobody picked A, because I keep, I mean, I'm, no, nobody picked B. Most of us, almost everyone picked uh, A. Nobody picked B. And I, I keep staring at B. And I'm like, okay, the primary objective of procedures perform to key phrase obtain an understanding. We said that we call that obtaining the understanding phase too, didn't we? Okay. So what do we do when we're in the obtaining the understanding phase? We perform what? We perform risk assessment procedures, don't we? So that knowledge is helping you to you know, perform the risk assessment procedures, which include evaluating the design of the controls and seeing if they were implemented and then using that to make an assessment of the risk of material misstatement. But the risk of material misstatement is an interaction between inherent risk and control risk. So I think it's very unfair of this question. And I don't know if this was a CPA exam question or not, or one that Becker wrote. It looks like a damaged CPA question that nobody got right. And so they kicked it out of the exam. You know, they keep having a question that is consistently missed by everybody. They'll kick that out of the exam. It gets released and then Becker gets it and includes it in the software. Okay. Because that ex question will never be seen on the exam. I'm of the opinion that Becker should be a little bit more careful about making this a class question. Maybe they're trying to me, have me give this speech right now by including this as a class question, but I don't think it's fair for the examiners to sit here and give you B as a choice. I don't, I really, in my book, you know, if you look at my book, I sat here and I drew a face next to that question. Where is it? You know, I drew a, a disgusted face next to that question. I don't know if you could see that because it just, you know, I was like, come on, don't, don't put that B there as a choice. The other ones, um, yeah, no, evaluate the consistency of application of management's policies. You might do some of that, but that's not in obtaining the understanding phase, okay? Okay, good. So I don't like that question. Again, to explain where I was going with that, the AICPA releases questions and once they release questions, they will never be seen again on the exam. So you're like, well, why are they showing it to us? Well, we know the nature of how they're testing certain concepts, right? And they release so many questions. I think it's either once a year or twice a year. So if you think about the questions that are in your question bank, and it's not so much for auditing because things have changed, you know, and continue to change, but there's kind of three groups of questions. One are ones that have appeared on the exam, have appeared on the exam, were disclosed by the AICPA before the exam was um, made non-disclosed, okay? Um, so the exam was um, was became non-disclosed in 1996. Were you guys born in 19 1996? I don't know. Um, and so if you look, I'll be there in a second. I just wanted to show you. Um, I can find it. So, this is my exam, May 1987, okay? This wasn't the actual, um, my actual booklet, but this used to be, in, and you walked out with this. When you took the exam, you walked out with your exam, okay? And so everybody knew what all the questions were. And so those questions were disclosed and Becker still has some of those old, old questions sitting in the software because they could still come up 
as a question. So when you take your exam, you may see an actual question that you had worked on. Now that population is becoming smaller, right? We're talking what, over 20 years now. That population is, is almost 30 years now, 96, not quite, but anyway, that population is becoming smaller now, um, but there are still some questions like that. Then there's those ones that since 1996, they have released that will not be on your exam, but at least, which I suspect this one is one of that nature, but at least we know how they're still testing a particular concept or were testing a particular concept. And then the third group are questions that Becker wrote. Okay, and so they will ask somebody like me, hey, can you come up with a bunch of questions about risk assessment? And so that might be the source of this one where somebody didn't think through the idea that uh, making that point about inherent risk. But I think it falls in the second category, one of those that have been released since 96. The AICPA kicked it off the exam because it's just it's problematic, in my opinion. Okay. Okay, good. Good work on that one. Let's go ahead and let's look at the next question. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and um, take a look at this one. And okay, good, pretty good results. I think that most of you probably remembered my senior moment there where I couldn't find what I was looking for, where it said right there in the book that you're looking for unusual transactions when you're performing analytical procedures and planning. You're looking and saying, okay, I'm in an industry, I'm auditing a restaurant and I'm auditing a restaurant just after say COVID had hit, right? How did they double their revenue during that time? That doesn't even make sense, right? And so if you saw an increase in doubling in revenue, you're probably gonna jump on that and say, hey, I've got some real work to do because that's just not making sense to me, okay? So that's why it's A. These others, you're gonna look for these things, but they are not the objective of analytical procedures. And I worry a little bit about the couple of people that picked other choices here because there was the whole moment where I fumbled with it and couldn't find the answer to this question being shown in the book, which indicates to me, maybe you weren't paying attention to the lecture. So please follow along. Okay. Okay, good. I'm going to go ahead and call for the break a little bit early because we do have um, a discussion about the uh, committee sponsoring organizations of the Treadway Commissions structure for internal control and that gets a little dry and stale uh, to be honest with you so I think it's a good time for us to have a break right now 
and then uh, we'll come back and when we're fresh from our break, we'll uh, roll through that material. Okay, so I'm showing, um, you know, close to 615. So I'm just going to make it an even uh, 625 that we'll come back for the break from the break. Okay, and um, I'm going to pause the recording, guys. Please remind me to start it up again. And, and resume the recording. And uh, let's go ahead and jump back in now to uh, module eight here, risk assessment uh, procedures. Now, before we get into some of the detail here, I want to point out, um, you know, finally a useful uh, pass key, which is an auditor must obtain an understanding of the design and implementation, implement, implementation of internal control during the planning phase of an audit in order for the auditor to understand the design and implementation of the control. The auditor understands the components of internal control, which is what we're going to focus here. But notice the book is kind of, you know, catching up with some of the things I've been talking about here, obtaining an understanding right of uh, what design and implementation okay now when we look at the internal control okay um we look at it and we say um that we have to conduct the risk assessment procedures obtaining understanding even if we don't test the control so again that's why i said we always obtain the understanding Sometimes we will do uh, the actual testing of the internal control. Now, when we look at the internal control, we have different objectives. Um, and the one that as auditors we are primarily interested in is the reliability of um, over finance reporting. We might care a little bit about efficiency of operations. We could care about compliance with laws and regulations and some engagements that is part of the audit as to whether or not an entity is in compliance with regulations. But for our purposes, the main one is that first one, reliability of financial reporting. Now, when you come over to the next slide, okay, and this gets a little annoying. I mean, I see why Becker did this. They put the components of internal control in this particular order, uh, in order to help you remember the mnemonic crime. But then they start going nuts with that and they keep giving that to you over and over. And they don't ever point out that this is not the way the committee of sponsoring organization of the Treadway Commission envisioned this. This is not the order that they envisioned it. And when you don't look at it in the order that they envisioned it, it just starts to become a listing of things and you're having trouble putting it together as a real process that we go through to evaluate the internal control and we're obtaining the understanding and making the risk assessments and whatnot. So in the chapter two slides, okay, there's this, which this is the way COSO looked at it. We have the objectives which is the operating objectives, the reporting, financial reporting and compliance, just like we saw in the book. But then when you look at the order, it's not spelling crime. Control environment is the most important. It touches all the other areas, involves the board of directors and whatnot. Based on that, the entity makes a, the entity should make a risk assessment on their ability to achieve the objective of reliability and financial reporting. And then they'll put control techniques, control activities, control and procedures in place to help achieve those objectives against those risks. Then they give information and communication to their staff as to what their responsibilities are in the information system. What are the person's responsibilities? They communicate all that out. Here's the control activities. And then they monitor. Monitoring is really what the internal audit department does. They are going to sit there and say, hey, look, we see that there's some problems with the controls. They feed that back up to the board of directors. Here comes a control environment. So this could also be a circle, right, as the process goes through. So think of it that way, even though when you look, you know, back at the textbook, they put the existing control activities last so that it spells crime. They really should have that what? 
it's really not even existing control activities, it's control activities should be third on this list as we are responding to the risk that we have assessed. When I say we, in that, in that context, I don't mean the auditor, I mean the entity's risk assessment. And the auditor is gonna use this understanding to then make their risk assessment, okay? Now, what is useful here though, is when they drew this crime thing, you know, graphically here, um, I like the way they put the control environment at the top because it is the most pervasive part of the control and that it touches all of the others, right? Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to quickly go through and look at these different components of the internal control, different elements of internal control and understand a little bit about them, starting with the control environment and control environment basically involves the tone at the top, okay? So if it's the tone at the top, we're talking about senior management, we're talking about the board of directors, right? Okay, so you look over and they say that, hey, participation, of those charged with governance, otherwise known as the board of directors, okay? You can look at things like organizational structure, okay? And remember we talked when we were talking about internal auditors, internal auditors, which I'm abbreviating IA, should report where? Remember we said there should be a direct line of reporting to the board, of the BOD is the board of directors. That's the kind of organizational structure things that you're looking at. You're looking at those charged with governance and seeing that they have an oversight role for the financial reporting and disclosure process. And as I mentioned, the, what, the uh, control environment is the most pervasive component of the entire uh, control structure, okay? All right, good. Risk assessment. When we talk about risk assessment, we are talking about the entities identification of um, risk that will help to, uh, that will uh, potentially cause them to uh, not achieve the reliability and financial reporting objective, okay? So this is not the auditor's risk assessment, it is what? The entity's risk assessment. The auditor will also do their own risk assessment, but there's an expectation that the entity would have done that, okay? Information and communication. And when we get into information, and again, guys, uh, we are now out of order, okay? Just to make sure we're clear, information and communication would come after we had established the control activities, right? Then comes the information communication. So just hold in your mind that we're gonna talk about the actual control procedures here in a minute and what some of them could be. But once we establish those, then we would go ahead the company would, you know, implement those into their information systems, their accounting systems, right? To authorize transactions and whatnot. Okay, and then um, we would want to make sure that tr uh, transactions and related disclosures for the financial systems, all uh, for the financial statements, all of that goes into the accounting information system. Okay. And then communication systems, okay, just, just make sure we've got accounting information systems, right, since we're worried about the accounting records, uh, supporting specific amounts involved in initiating, authorizing, and reporting and processing transactions. Why don't you flashcard that, that that is something that, um, you know, the information system should do. I know that seems, you know, well, no kidding, but um, the problem is I've, saw, I've seen a question that asked that. And the way they ask the question, it gets a little like, huh, what are they saying exactly here in this question? That's the answer. That's what the accounting information system should do, okay? And then communication system really is how do we communicate the responsibilities for internal control to our staff, uh, the internal control of financial reporting to our staff, training, manuals, you know, reminders about the importance of the internal control, et cetera, okay? Okay, good. Then they talk about monitoring, okay? And monitoring is uh, the thing that comes last, not the existing control activities. And that's really um, the monitoring process is going to include. And the internal audit function is key. So why don't you flashcard the internal audit function is 
a key part of the monitoring component of the internal control. Okay. And then again, control activities would be the uh, third piece. And uh, I mean, the yeah, the third piece, even though they've listed it here last, and it's in response to the risks. Now, I don't like using a mnemonic to help you remember just a laundry list of control activities. Because remember, guys, we do what? We look at it as an assertion related to an account. We think of a potential misstatement, and then we look for the control that will help prevent or detect that misstatement. And that's the way you need to think about internal controls, not as just some random list of controls that you have to memorize. So I don't like this uh, paid tips mnemonic because it puts you into a mode where you're not thinking about the controls as they relate to the assertions. And they only mention the assertions one time here in this whole stupid list of paid tips and pre-numbering of documents, yeah, would help you to make sure that you have recorded all transactions. Let's see, one, two, three, five, what happened to four? So for completeness, that's going to be useful, right? To have pre-numbered documents. One, two, three, four, four. How come we have two transaction number fours? What's going on here? That would help you with the existence assertion, right? Okay, but then they abandon any more discussion of assertions. And so I'm going to go ahead and just sort of, uh, you know, fill these bubbles in for you. Okay, but um, I'm gonna also gonna ask you to, um, you know, flashcard a couple of ones that are key, but I don't want you sitting here just memorizing a bunch of internal control techniques and not knowing how they would relate and apply to the assertions. Okay. Now, having said that, I am going to ask you to flashcard this right here because this I see coming up a lot in questions, which is what periodically there should be a process in a company, at least annually where there's a reconciliation between the accounting records and the actual physical existence of assets. Um, you know, I don't know if you've experienced this, but once a year in GAO, here we come, you know, the uh, IT folks to make sure that, you know, the serial number or whatever ID tag on my computer matched to what their records were saying, right? You do that periodically, otherwise you're gonna lose track of your assets, right? And so that's a uh, key control. Segregation of duties rounds out this uh, silly little mnemonic here, paid tips, okay? Segregation of duty, and let's just go ahead and flashcard that pass key down there. You're going to separate the authorization from the transaction, from the record keeping, and the actual custody of the related asset. We're going to talk about departments, different departments, okay, in a company, in a four, okay? And you're going to be looking at this and saying, I have to memorize what all these departments do? No, every department is either an authorization department, a record keeping department or a custody department. And so the reason we have different departments that do different functions is to achieve this separation of duty, okay? And they give you the mnemonic here is ARC, there it is, okay? So you can remember that. So you wanna keep separated authorization, record keeping and custody. And I'm gonna keep pointing out to you when we go through the departments in A4, whether a department is authorization, record keeping or custody, okay? Okay, good. So that's the main thing there uh, with the internal control. And I guess an auditor, in heaven gets their wings every time they mention, you know, the word crime, there's a little bell that rings, ding, and they get, you know, their wings in heaven every time we mention crime because they put it in there three or four times. Meanwhile, the thing is effed up because it's not in order, <laughs> okay? It's what, one, two, yeah, three, and then information and then monitoring, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and um, the um, framework that we just looked at, okay, is COSO, Committee of Sponsoring Organizations of the Treadway Commission. The AICPA has their own framework because I think they got jealous of, you know, COSO. Uh, but the one that everybody uses is the COSO framework. So, okay. 
Um, and when you read the, uh, when we get into the reporting on internal control for public companies, you'll see that commonly the criteria that they use to evaluate internal control in public companies is COSO. That's almost always called out, okay? Preventative controls prevent the misstatement from occurring. Detective controls do what? They detect the misstatement after it has occurred, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over and um, they come up and the book is catching up with us, guys. We've already said now several times that when you obtain the understanding, you evaluate the design and whether the control has been implemented, right? So again, going back to my little jewelry store example where they did nothing but lock the door, we didn't like the design, right? When we went to the other jewelry shop, we liked the design. But if we got there in the morning to do a walkthrough and only one employee came in and put both combinations in, that control is not implemented. So it has to be designed and implemented. If it is designed and implemented and we're good with all that, we like the design and it was implemented, then we will go and test the operating effectiveness. So right here, we're still talking about risk assessment procedure. We're still talking about evaluating the design and implementation of the internal control. So there's that phrase again, obtain an understanding of the five components, looking at their design and implementation. Now, when we evaluate the design, we're saying, is the control designed in a way that it is even capable of preventing, detecting, and maybe even correcting uh, the uh, misstatement? That's what we mean by design. Will it even work? Locking the door is not a very good design of a control, right? Implementation, the control has been impl imp implemented. I'm having trouble with that word today for some reason, if it is being used. So if we get there early and you know the control is each person has to put in their combination, and the one person has both combinations, and that control is not being implemented. Okay. So how will we evaluate the um, design and the implementation? We will inquire of entity personnel. We sat down. And we said, hey, you know, um, tell us about the controls, right? Observation of the application of controls. We get there early and we watch them uh, putting the combinations in. Inspection of documents. We saw that they filled out those little uh, inventory sheets, right? And so we would watch them that day filling the thing out, okay? Observation of the entity premises and plant facilities. Remember I said there were cameras? They were watching the whole thing. So you'd probably ask, hey, can I please see the, uh, the recording? I wanna see the recording. And sometimes you ask that question and they'll say, oh, uh, actually there's no film. There's no, we're not actually recording. We're not actually recording anything. Okay, oh, okay, great. You find that out by observation. And then walk through, which they're going to say they discuss below, which I'm going to do it right now. Okay, walkthrough is really designed. Uh, I should use the word design. Is really all about uh, getting to the um, implementation. Okay, so I guess we got to go all the way over to the next page to see what they're saying here about walkthroughs. Okay, so a walkthrough traces the flow of transactions and data relevant to financial reporting through the accounting set system from inception until it is finally recorded in the financial statements. So you pick a transaction, you pick a day, and you sit there and you walk it through and see how the controls are applied to that, okay? And um, it allows you to um, really, they say evaluate the design, but it also, and more probably more importantly, it allows you to see if the control has been implemented, okay? And again, you can select a single transaction and taste, trace it through, and um, you can identify key steps, okay? Okay, good. Now they talk about some of the procedures and they talk about inquiry, okay? And they talk about reperformance. Okay, so when you're sitting there, you may actually sit in the seat of whoever's supposed to be implementing that control and see if you get a feel for how effective that control it would be in achieving the objective. Okay, okay, good. So after you do that, <laughs> then 
you can go ahead and assess the risk of material misstatement by understanding of the design and implementation of the entity's relevant controls. And then that helps you determine the timing, extent, and nature of your further audit procedure. So you can see that the book has all the information. I just didn't feel like they did a good job of putting it into an order that I think we understand from those couple of little PowerPoint slides that you've looked at now. Okay. Question on any of that? Okay, good. Now, after you go through that process, of course, auditors document, 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 right? And to document that you did obtain the understanding that you were supposed to and you made your assessment, you can use the different types of techniques to um, allow you to uh, document your understanding. You can use a flow chart, internal control questionnaire, narrative, narrative and documentation from the client. These days, clients know, you know, they've done it under audit before, they know you're gonna start asking all these dumb questions, I mean, all these important questions about internal control. So they just say, here, the whole thing is written up for you. Now, of course, you'll have to do some work to validate that. You just don't take their word for it that it's all there and implemented and whatnot. But at least you've got a good start on understanding. You can read through things and you can just put that in your work papers and that covers your documentation that you've got something that describes internal control. Okay, now the flow chart. I don't think you got this far in life, guys, not knowing that a flow chart is a symbolic diagram, okay, representing a sequential flow. I think you know that, okay. Um, come over, and there are uh, these flow charting. Well, I don't know, I went too far. There are system flow charts, and there are program flow charts, okay. System flow charts actually will show you the design of the entire system, whereas a program is just looking at the logic of a computer program, okay? Um, flow charting symbols, and I look at this thing and I'm like, what is this, 1981 or something? You know, I mean, I'm looking at some of these symbols here. I'm like, who has a tape file anymore? I don't know, you know, uh, display, okay, disk file, I don't know, but uh, go ahead, guys, and uh, copy this and put it into your um, flashcards if there's not already one in your Becker pre-purchase flashcards or that uh, you purchased when you got the, the package here, um, because I don't want you to get a question on the exam where they show these flow charting symbols, and then you're like, you'll say, what does it mean? And you're like, I don't know what any of this means, okay? So just flashcard that, okay? Internal control questionnaire. Yes is good, no is bad. Okay. And so you'll call out, do they have the control that achieves this objective? Yes is good, no is bad. You see the no indicates a weakness and then we'll help you to evaluate the effectiveness of the internal control, okay? Narrative is a written version of a flow chart. And this was the way GAO used to document our understanding. They would make us write something called a cycle memo. And one time I was on an assignment where this to the team before I took over the assignment the, from the year before, they wrote a 370 page cycle memo. And I was like, what the hell? Who's going to read this? I ain't reading this thing. Okay. So you really should have a, um, you know, internal control narrative where the system is less complex. Okay. If you have to start getting into 300 pages to describe a system, you better bust out a flow chart on that. No one's going to read 370 page, whatever the hell those maniacs. The problem was, is that GAO went through this process where they drafted a bunch of people from the non-accounting areas to come and start doing financial statement audits. So people that you know had degrees that allowed them to evaluate federal programs came in and started trying to you know play ball in the financial statement arena. And I'm like, okay, now we've got people auditing without a license. Get these people away from me, okay? So anyway, but. Um, you should use it for less complex systems, okay? Okay, good. Now you come over. I'll try to avoid the uh, 
the what do they call that when somebody thinks back to the wars and the flashbacks <laughs> from years of geo sometimes i'll be sitting there and i'll be hanging out with my friends and all of a sudden i'll say you know i don't know why i allowed the client to get away with that i should have asked them for more information they'll be like what are you talking about you retired five years ago i'm like yeah well i don't know for some reason this is coming to me now so anyway okay come over and documentation uh, from the client could also be used but of course you need to verify that okay now cpa exam loves questions dealing with limitations right what are the limitations of this what are the limitations of that so flashcard limitation of any system of internal control is that management may override there could be human error there could be collusion all of these things would be uh, limitations of the internal control flashcard then. Okay. Okay, good. Now, the IT environment. And when you look at this, guys, notice that we have what? We have control environment, we have information communication, we have the control activities. I'm going to go in correct order. We have what? we have then the monitoring. So we still have the five components, but now it's in an IT environment. So the main takeaway from this is that the information technology still has what? The same five components of internal control that we've already been talking about. All right. Now, when you look at controls, you could have manual versus automated controls. Manual controls are good for large or unusual or non-reoccurring transactions, okay? You can go ahead and flashcard that. Whereas automated controls could be good for a high volume of recurring transactions, right? You can go ahead and flashcard that. And um, note that manual controls could be used to uh, monitor automated controls, right? Periodically, even though you have a control that's automated, you would go ahead and uh, you know see that those controls are still working appropriately by um, um, checking them manually. Okay, okay, good. Now you come over and IT controls versus application controls. Okay, IT controls, uh, general controls are at a high level. They relate to many applications and. Um, they can be categorized such as controls over data center and network operations, okay? Um, and so you can see, uh, for example, uh, controls over data and network operations, for example, disaster recovery. And this was the one that I had a flashback on. My friends were like, Okay, didn't you retire eight years ago? That's still bothering you? We were on an engagement looking at corporate credit unions, okay? And they told us that they had a complete backup system in case of a disaster. In Can this was in Kansas City. The credit union was in Kansas City, the corporate credit union. They told us, yeah, we have a complete backup of our system. We have it in the caves. The caves out there in Kansas City, that's where we have all our backup. Now, my understanding of those caves is they're filled with bats. So, you know, I'm thinking to myself, now, they didn't have a complete backup. System. Why didn't we insist, okay, show me. <laughs> show me that, that, that goddamn thing. I want to see it, you know. So one day I was just sitting there, ah, why did I let just accept that? We should have gone and looked at that backup. But these are the type of things, disaster recovery, use of passwords. These are at a higher level. They apply to many different applications. An application control is going to relate to a specific type of transaction, okay? For example, you could have a uh, control, um, you know, over payroll that doesn't let a payroll check process that is over a certain high dollar amount, right? So you take the highest paid person, I don't know, the CEO or something, whatever their salary is, there should never be a payroll uh, check that goes over that. Or you have a control in there so that the total of all payroll doesn't exceed what you know you're paying all your employees. You know what you're paying them. You add that all up. And when the payroll processes, it shouldn't be in excess of that, uh, whatever that total is. Anyway, 
These are examples of application controls. They relate to just one application, okay? Now, which do you think is more important, the general controls or the application controls? That's a question. General controls. General controls. If there's problem with the general controls, you could throw all the application controls in the toilet. I mean, you know, like our former president, okay? <laughs> what happens, you could just sit there and throw, I'm saying that because they announced today that apparently when Trump didn't like documents, he flushed them down the toilet, they're saying that, so anyway. But, um, you know, you're sitting there and you don't care because if I can hack into the system, then I can mess around with the application control. So you got to have strong, the, the phrase is, the saying is, that the applications controls are only as strong as the general controls that they rely on, okay? Okay, good, now you come over and yeah, flashcard IT benefits, guys. I know that it is so self-explanatory that it's gonna put you to sleep here, okay? But uh, flashcard that I'm almost not gonna even read them out. I mean, I'm not gonna read them out because they're too obvious. But I want you to flat, you're like, John, you're not gonna read it to us and you're telling us to flashcard it? Yeah, because the exam loves. Even in the BEC section, if you guys are taking B, some of my folks like Serena and some of the other are also studying BEC, they could ask you, okay, to uh, write an, uh, a memo talking about you know, IT benefits versus IT risks. And again, I'm not gonna read these to you. I want you to flashcard them. So make sure that you, you know, are always making sure you've you know, got a good flashcard around risks and benefits, um, you know, limitations, that sort of thing are the type of things that the exam loves to ask about. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at another couple of questions. Why not? Okay, guys, let's go ahead and um, take a look at this one. And um, you make me very happy, okay? Everyone got this one right. And I think that um, you're kind of seeing that some of those key words that we've been talking about are going to be helpful for you. And that when you look, you can see that what, during obtaining the understanding phase, what do we do? 
we look at the design and whether the control has been implemented. So they talked about design here, didn't they? Okay, the rest of these are nonsense. Effectiveness of internal control, we what? Uh, they have been placed in operation. We could test operating effectiveness, but that's in the further audit procedure, right? That's in the test of detail phase, okay? Not in the obtaining the understanding phase. Effectiveness, um, consistency with internal controls are being applied. That's what you're doing when you're testing operating effectiveness. Did they use this consistently during the year, right? You look at a sample of transactions and look at the sign off on those. Controls related to each principal transaction and account balance, no, you're not going to be looking at each principal class account balance. You're looking at what things that are going to be um, related to the assertions, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let's try this next one. Okay, this question's a little tougher, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at this one. And I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. And uh, we did pretty good on it, considering it's a little tougher question. 70% of us got it right. Um, but um, let's just look at this one. And uh, the answer here is A, okay? Now let's just go ahead and look at the wrong answers first. In planning and audit, the auditor's knowledge about the design. If we're looking at the design, what stage are we in? What phase are we in? Obtaining an understanding phase, right? If we're looking at the design, okay? So would we use that to document the assessed level of control risk? First of all, there are no, there are no procedures that are done to document something. Okay, you do a procedure, you document it, but you don't do the procedure to document. Okay, you're going to do a procedure, you're going to document it. So that's just sort of trying to make itself sound right when, you know, someone is giving up on this question and just says, well, you got to document it. Okay, C, determine whether controls have been circumvented by collusion. Good luck, have fun. We'll see you, you know, in hell. They're not going, you're not going to be able to determine a transaction. That's the whole problem with collusion. Okay. B, assess the operating efficiency of controls. Well, I've heard of what? 
looking at operating effectiveness. I've never heard of operating efficiency. And we don't, you know, when it relates to the internal controls, and we don't do that when we're evaluating the design. That is the objective of what? The testing when we get to the further audit procedure, we get to the test of details phase. So you can see that those definitions that I talked about, the way the uh, wording is put on those couple of slides is key to being able to answer questions like this, right? Now, okay, the right answers identify the type of potential misstatements that occur. And I'm looking at that and I'm like, okay, did the examiners, you know, look at my little chart here and come up with this question? Because that's exactly what we did during the, what, obtaining the understanding phase. We thought about the potential misstatements, didn't we? Okay. So it is key that you sit here and you look at, you know, and I think that these one, two, three, four, five slides, I, you know, if I may say so, because I made them, are very helpful towards, um, you know, you understanding this stuff and be able to answer these questions. Because you can see how they word things in a way that it can get a little confusing for you. This helps you to kind of, you know, focus on key phrases and whatnot in the questions. Okay. Okay, good. With all of that, then I think we are ready to go to the next question. Okay, guys, let's go ahead and take a look at this one. I'm gonna end the poll. And uh, okay, not quite as good as we've done on some of the others here. Um, so uh, B is, uh, excuse me, C is the correct answer. So most of us got it right, but still I was hoping we'd be more in the 70% range, but let's just go ahead and take a look at this one, okay? So they say, which of the following types of evidence would an auditor most likely examine to determine whether internal controls are operating as designed? Okay. In the obtaining the understanding phase, we look at the design, don't we? If we want to see that they're operating as designed, then we must be looking to see that that control has been implemented. 
right? Is it operating as designed? Is it implemented? Is it being used? Um, I think that this is probably one of those old questions that got kicked off the exam because they used to use the word design and placed into operation. And then they changed that word to implement it. Okay, so it could be that this question comes from before that time. And Becker says it's still okay to leave it in there because that's what that means. Operating as design means, is it being implemented? Okay, so if we're saying, okay, we're looking to see if the control has been implemented, will gross margin information regarding the client's industry help us with that? Gordon, absolutely not. Uh, confirmation of accounts receivable is a substantive procedure that we do after we've made our assessment of risk and material misstatement and whatnot. So that's way off. Anticipated results documented in budgets or forecast. I mean, this to me sounds like, you know, a drunk CEO talking. Well, we have anticipated results documented in budget and forecast. I don't even know what that means. Okay, so, uh, you know, some of these choices, I can't even comment on them. Okay, so the answer here, I, I really don't know what to tell you about them. But when you think of implemented as operated as designed, then this becomes a very easy question, because they're using the EDP programs. Okay, good. Let's come over then and let's take a look at the effect of information technology on the audit. Okay. And what we're going to be talking about here is really some um, computer assisted audit techniques. Okay. Now, know that in a computerized environment that your uh, client has, okay, um, there may be certain duties that can be combined that would be separated in a manual. So, you know, computers don't open, uh, don't order inventory for themselves and take it home. Okay, so you could have what the authorization of the transaction, the ordering of the items uh, done, uh, automated, done by the computer, right? The other thing you have to consider is the disappearing audit trail, okay, and that um, often there is no paper. And even if, you know, you're saying, well, well they can just store it on their system, but um, Many, many uh, businesses, especially uh, financial institutions like banks and whatnot, they purge their systems regularly because of the volume of transactions that they have. They don't have these uh, resources to store everything. So you can't sit there and say, well, you know, give me all of January's transactions X, Y, Z. And they're going to say, <laughs> that was gone at the end of January. That was gone, you know, in the second week in, in January. So you'd have to plan accordingly around that. Okay. Okay, good. Now you come over and um, take a look at potential for increased errors and irregularities. Again, um, kind of looking at some uh, IT benefits versus IT risks. Okay. So if you look here, um, these couple are going to be IT benefits. Okay, and I want you to flashcard these as such. Okay, so what happens? You're sitting there and processing consistencies improved in a computerized environment. Um, oh, okay, no, that's not a benefit, John, is it? Okay, so go ahead and flashcard that uniform processing uh, consistencies improved. Um, and then starting here, I want to go ahead and flashcard some IT risks here. Okay, so uh, automated transactions are not subject to the same type of um, in a computerized environment, there's increased potential for systematic errors. So there's a program logic problem that applies to every single transaction instead of it being a one-time error in a manual system. They're not subject to the same type of authorization. Uh, when information is automatically transferred, um, inadvertent or errors 
Okay. Um, what else? The opportunity for remote access. Someone can hack into your system. Concentration of information. So if there's a crash or something, everything goes down. Decrease human involvement. Errors of fraud in design. Computer disruptions. Um, going back to that example, the credit union um, that we looked at, that they said everything in the backup was in the uh, caves. And then um, they told us that they had had a problem. So what happens is corporate credit unions serve as automated clearing houses. So smaller credit unions send their information to corporate credit unions and then they disperse it out to uh, different places. And Congress wanted us to look at these corporate credit unions. So we started taking it because of their important role in you know, the whole credit union industry. So we start looking at that and uh, they tell us when we walked in that they had a problem, that their system, their automated clearinghouse system crashed because their staff ran both the backup and the system maintenance simultaneously. And you're not supposed to do that. First you back up, then you run the maintenance. And so they've tried to run it simultaneously and they crashed the whole system. When they crashed the system, it caused a disruption that um, affected several credit unions. People's paychecks were bouncing and stuff because the information didn't get processed through. So. When I got in there, I, you know, I said, well, what was the cost of that? They said, oh, well, there was no real cost to it. We just had this issue. And then when we did a tour of the facility, right? You're supposed to do a tour of the facility. They had written on the whiteboard, ACH code. And it was a job code for the ACH. So when we got back to the conference room, I says, uh, well, what was that? He said, ACH code, what was that for? Oh, yeah, that's right. We have been having to do some follow up on that. Then they gave us a number of associated with the cost of the credit union for that mistake they made. So, um, you know, if there's some sort of disruption, um, you know, they could have delays in recording transactions. In the case of a bank, it could be, you know, affecting a lot of a lot of people. OK, so go ahead and flashcard these as IT risks. OK, OK, good. Come over and uh, well, here's some IT benefits now. Um, so we have that one benefit up there um, that I had you flashcard, okay? And then let's come down here and let's include that in a flashcard of IT benefits. Okay, so potential increase um, for supervision and um, review um, for data analytics and whatnot. Okay, so put those down as a couple of IT benefits. All right, okay, so we got risk, we got benefits there. All right, good. Let's go ahead now and let's start taking a look at this idea of auditing around the computer. We've already talked about IT auditor in a separate uh, chapter. So I think it back, well, earlier in this chapter, but let's just look at um, auditing around the computer, which basically says, hey, I'm gonna go ahead and in an automated environment, ask them to print everything and look at it that way. Okay, well, that's probably not the way you would do it. You would be using computer assisted audit techniques Okay, and uh, these computer assisted audit techniques, there are five of them. Now I'm going to ask you to flashcard the definitions, but the beauty is that the names they use describes what they do very well. Okay, so you come over and they talk about transaction tagging. Okay, and transaction tagging allows the auditor to use an electronic mark or a tag and follow the transaction through the client system. So if they have an IT environment, you can take a transaction and you can actually do almost an electronic walkthrough of that transaction by tagging it and seeing how the various uh, controls are applied to that transaction it goes through. Embedded audit module, and this can help you with the disappearing audit trail and that you can sit there and just uh, put something in the client system that saves off specific transactions. So if they tell you, 
oh, we capitalize any expense over $500. Well, you can put an embedded audit module in the repairs and maintenance account to capture off any transaction greater than $500, right? Well, why did you expense that in repairs and maintenance if you told us you capitalize anything over 500, okay? Going over to the next uh, page, test data, okay? And test data is basically where we go through and we run through auditor transactions, dummy transactions, and we put those through the client system um, with auditor data, it's dummy transactions, and we do that offline. We do that offline. So we do that on the weekend or something. So we have a set of transactions that we know how they should process Okay, and we run them through the client system to see if the client system processes them the way we had anticipated they would. Okay, now integrated test facility is very, very similar to um, the test data, but now we do it online. So again, it's auditor data using the client system to process transactions online, but we do it when the client personnel, we do the dummy transactions, um, you know, during the day, we commingle, okay, uh, the live data with the dummy accounts, okay? And so you can see integrated test facility is describing, we've integrated the dummy transactions with the real transaction and client personnel don't know that the test is being run and they don't know the dummy transaction from the uh, uh, real transaction, okay? Now flashcard that, that gives you a good example, but let me ask you, why would an auditor choose test data instead of integrated test facility? I mean, integrated test facility is gonna give you a better read of what's happening because now we've got the client's personnel in effect, in a, intermixing with the data, interfacing with the data. Why would you do this? instead of this. One's online, one's offline. Wouldn't there be a risk that you could mess up the client system? Yeah, the client may say, here, you're not mixing in the uh, data during, are you, are you out of your mind? Okay, so if you use test data, you would have to what? You would have to um, do something else to get comfortable with the client's uh, personnel's interaction with that stuff, right? Okay. And then our fifth, we've got five computer assisted audit techniques. Our fifth is parallel simulation. And with parallel simulation, we're going to do what? We're going to take the client's data and we're going to run it through a software that's under the auditor's control to see if the client's data processes uh, in our system the way it does on their system. And that gives us the comfort level that the system is working correctly and processing the data correctly. Parallel simulation, right? Here's how they did it. We're gonna develop something that'll simulate what the client system is supposed to do and see if it processes the same way. So I've asked you to flashcard these, but I'm also pointing out to you that what? Uh, the title is very descriptive. Transaction tagging, an electronic tag, track the system through the client system. Test data is what? Auditor data, client system offline. Integrated test facility, the facility auditor data, client system online, right? Okay, integrated. And then parallel simulation, client data, auditor system paralleling, paralleling what the client system is supposed to do. Okay, generalized audit software packages. Okay, and you have probably already looked at some of these in your auditing class. The um, instructor maybe made you use something like IDEA or Tableau or some of these. Okay, that's basically what they're talking about. In GAO, we used IDEA and we used IDEA when we audited public debt. Okay, and we took a dollar unit sample that all we needed to do was get a flat file from the Bureau of Public Debt, and then we put in whatever our parameters were, our you know, inherent risk, our control risk, our risk of uh, material misstatement, put all those different parameters in there, and then you just run 
against the client system and it selected a dollar unit system, a dollar unit sample, I should say. And we'll talk about that in the, in the next chapter, but dollar unit sample on what was then on only $5 trillion. That was the public debt at that time. It was only $5 trillion. You could not run a dollar unit sample on a $5 trillion balance manually if your life depended on it. If you use one of these systems, all you do is tell the client for the data. You don't have to have any specialized knowledge about their system. And it allows you to go ahead and put, um, sample a much larger uh, amount of transactions. Okay. So you can use the substand and do your substand test directly on the client's system. Okay. So let's look at some where they call out some of the advantages, right? We always like to focus on these advantages that they call out of using the generalized audit software packages, allow the auditor sample and test a much higher percentage of the data. Uh, there's really, they say little technical knowledge. Look, you got to know how to use the software, but in the Windows world, once you get used to using a software, it's pretty uh, easy after that, right? Uh, without sacrificing quality. So you can look at much more transactions and you don't have to have a whole lot of technical knowledge about the client system. <clears throat> okay. All right, good. Let's go ahead and let's I've take got a question. A quick question. Mm -hmm. um, in the real world, so like what is the work product? You know, what ends up in your work paper file? Do, do these software programs print out some kind of a result uh, document that then becomes your evidence that this thing is functioning properly? Well, I don't know that it has to be printed out. I mean, I, I, maybe not printed, but yeah. Electronic work papers, you know. Um, yeah, there'd be probably some sort of readout from the system that creates probably a PDF. Or yeah, something. or some something that, that then will stay in your file that's separate from the system. Um, and, and it would do that even if you had a situation Something where it'll stay in your file that is separate from the system. I mean, the result. No, no, but I mean, it's no, what I mean is sep separate from the client system. I mean, your your work paper is in your your place. It's not in their place. Correct. So are you talking about the generalized audit software packages? Or the that other... or, or also like, you know, if and I guess I guess if that's what everybody uses. So that's what you would use to do these other things. Um, but yeah, I mean, there would be some like parallel simulation. Let's just talk about that one for a second. So you would sit there and you would, you know, run something in the system that says the result of these transactions in the client system was A. The result from our parallel simulation was you know, hopefully A also, if it was B, well, then we'd have to follow up, right? And understand, right. well, why did the thing, you know, turn out differently? And that outcome would be documented in the work paper. So you'd have, you know, what we always used to put was, was the uh, scope, source, scope, and objective of a, of a work paper, right? Okay, so source, where did we get it? Computerized software package, parallel simulation program. Mm -hmm um you know objective to determine if the client system is processing these type of transactions correctly and then um you know you'd have a conclusion based on this audit procedure right we found that all the transactions processed correctly no exceptions noted based on the procedure we found that you know transaction 17 over here did not process correctly in conversation with the client we found that their system has this problem if the dollar amount is over a certain amount. Here's the exception. And then, you know, maybe there's another work paper where you went through and tested all transactions to that level to see, you know, what the degree of misstatement was. And as a result, you have this adjustment, you know. So I think it would look something like that. I would, you know. Okay, thank you. I, I just, I had no clue when I was, you know, yeah, this. these these softwares, you know, they generate an outcome. You know, there'll there'll be an outcome report that they'll that it'll generate that you'll put it in with your work papers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And again, those work papers, I don't know about you, these, these days I'm thinking almost everything is electronic, right? I mean, yeah, no, I, I, I meant that, but you know, I was trying to, you know, I was thinking like an Excel spreadsheet or, a, or a what, whatever right. your document record system is, you, you would have to get something and put it in there. Yes, <laughs> yeah. correct, yes. So. Yeah, I mean, even these days, if they give you a hard copy document, you probably end up scanning it, right? Exactly, right, yeah, yeah. no, I, I get that, okay. thank you. Yeah, sure. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and let's take a look at a um, couple of questions here then. Okay, good guys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll here because it looks like everybody's already responded to this one. Uh, and yeah, uh, most of us got it right. 75% of us anyway got it right. Um, integrated test facility. A couple of folks you can see picked C. C is parallel simulation. Um, let's just look at the way this question was described. Which of the following computer assisted art techniques? allows fictitious and real transactions. Well, if there's fictitious transactions, it's not parallel simulation. Parallel simulation is taking what? Actual client data and running it through a software that's under the auditor's control to see if the results come out. So there are no fictitious. Fictitious transactions are used in what? In test data, and an integrated test facility. And with the integrated test facility, we do what? We commingle the real transactions with the fake dummy transactions, fictitious transactions. Okay, all right, good. Let's look at question two. Okay, let's look at this one. Looks like most of us had a chance to uh, respond to this. And is there something I'm not saying right? I mean, I'm seeing four people picked 
test data. And I think I've said that in, in D is the correct answer is parallel simulation. And I think I've said now a couple of times that when we are using test data, it is what? An integrated test facility, it is dummy transactions, right? That we're looking at that are run through the client system. Okay. The only difference between the two is we commingle the dummy, the fake, fictitious transactions with the real ones. This one is saying client input data on the auditor system. That's parallel simulation, right? Does it, somebody want to try to explain to me what's not being said in a manner that you can use the words to apply to the question here? Okay, guys, make sure you're following the lecture and not just playing the game of let me just, you know, have my name up there. And when I hear him, you know, put up a poll question, I'll um, respond. And, um, you know, then I'll go back to other homework class or something for another class or something. Okay, if you're doing that, then, you know, this is not the class for you. The point of this class, this is weightlifting. This is weightlifting. And if you want to do good at weightlifting, you can't be doing, you know, English homework during the weightlifting. Okay, so. If I may, so I yeah. was between A and D and I ended up selecting A. Uh, okay. And really it's just, it was the amount of, or the way that the, that the book wrote, the client system is used to process the auditor's data offline while still under the auditor's control for test data. And that is what made me ultimately choose A, but my initial gut instinct was D. So it was just a matter of choosing the wrong thing in my I case. see, because you're saying client data under the auditor's control. Control, which was, yeah. I mean, it, I, see. I, I know that it was clearly meant to confuse us that questions are written that way. Um, but it wasn't that I wasn't paying attention or anything. I didn't want you to get okay. that. No, and I appreciate that. Yeah, I think the, and that's, that's the reason I asked. Um, because, you know, to get that feedback, because the processing client uh, input data, whereas the integrated test facility and the um, test uh, data are using what dummy transactions, right? The auditor comes up with transactions to be run through the system in those two cases, right? Whereas this was just talking about processing client data. Hello? I got it. No, I got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead then and let's take a look at the next question.
Okay, guys, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this one. Looks like most of us had a chance to respond, so I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. And um, yeah, good outcome here. Looks like most of us got this one right. A is the correct answer. Um, now, when we look at this one, um, you know, hopefully the story I gave about using ideas, a journalized audit software package helped you to get A because um, basically you just get a file from the client and then you can run all kinds of different procedures, sampling procedures and whatnot against the um, using that generalized auto software package and you don't have to become the you know expert in the client system okay now um when i look at d i mean d um you know i don't i don't even understand d reduce the level required test of controls to relatively small amount i mean that's going to depend on the level of um you know um, risk of assessing control risk too low that you're willing to accept. In other words, how willing are you to accept a risk that your sample will not be representative of the population? So I don't, D is way off. Substantiate the accuracy of data through self checking digits and hash totals. Um, you know, that's not something that we need generalized auto software packages for. Consider increasing the use of substantive tests and transactions in place of analytical procedures. When I looked at B, I'm like, well, yeah, because if you were sitting there and um, you have a generalized audit software package that can run a procedure over, say, an entire balance of relatively small transactions, you might do that rather than do an analytical procedure. So I kind of think B could be an advantage, but they're saying, what is the what? Primary advantage. So you had to realize that both A and B was an advantage, but the more important advantage is the fact that it allows us to, um, you know, get information that are on computer files and we don't have to master the client system to get to that data. Okay, question. Okay, guys, we're going to actually get out a little bit early today, so that is good. Um, make sure you are keeping up with your homework now. You should be able to, um, you know, get all the way through chapter two now, and um, we will uh, jump into chapter three next week, Thursday. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you. Okay, guys. I am going to stop.